You're watching BBC World News. Our breaking news uh, this hour is that in the last hour, President Erdogan of Turkey has said the military operation against Kurdish fighters in northeast Syria has begun. This is what he said in a tweet. Turkish armed forces have started the peace operation against the PKK and YPG and Daesh, that's another name for IS, terrorist organizations. He says our aim is to destroy the terror corridor that's formed on our southern border and bring peace to the region. Shortly after the president's tweet, Turkish jets were seen taking off from Diyarbakir and artillery fire has also been reported across the border. Turkey has summoned the U.S. ambassador to Turkey to brief him on the events. Well, Turkey had been poised to advance into northeast Syria since U.S. troops began vacating the area in an abrupt policy shift by President Donald Trump. Uh, it was widely criticized in Washington as a betrayal of America's Kurdish militia allies. The Kurdish forces now are asking the U.S. for a no-fly zone. They want protection against Turkish jets. So that's a dilemma, uh, really, for Washington. I think we can go to Washington now. Uh, to our correspondent, uh, Gary O'Donoghue. Uh, just, Gary, to remind our viewers that there has been this, this reversal, this about turn in uh, the White House's position on northern Syria. There has, and it's not the first uh, reversal by the president. He, he did a feint in, in this sense back in December of last year where he threatened to withdraw these troops from this area uh, in that northeastern uh, corner there of, of uh, Syria on the Turkish border. Uh, and that cost him his uh, defence secretary at the time, and he seemed to pull back from that. Uh, but at the weekend he announced that these troops who are in these particularly sensitive areas right along the border, around 50 or so of them, he says, have been pulled back. Um, that has uh, effectively given the green light to Turkey to, to go in, and we understand, as, as you've been describing, that they are going in. There are still around 1,000 US troops altogether in that area. It's not clear whether they're moving out entirely or whether or not uh, they're staying in their bases. I mean, it, a thousand troops is quite a small number and they're going to be quite exposed potentially so that will be a concern for the military minds at the Pentagon here uh, and also there's the huge question of what happens uh, particularly to those uh, those camps with those ISIS those IS fighters in them I mean there are tens of thousands of them in those camps uh, the president said this morning on Twitter that he believes it's up to Turkey to take responsibility for those IS fighters uh, but as we know, the Turks are, are really more interested in, in the Kurds in that area than they are in, in the IS fighters. So it remains to be seen. Um, there's been some really stern criticism from some of his most loyal uh, supporters here. Lindsey Graham. I mean, this, this is not since uh, we've learnt about uh, the invasion or the, the, the beginning of the, the operation this morning. But certainly over the weekend, over the last couple of days, people like Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator, who's a very staunch supporter of the president, saying this is the biggest mistake of his presidency, potentially violates his oath of office. Please you know, turn it around now. The leader of the Senate, Republican Mitch McConnell, saying very similar things. And of course, people like Lindsey Graham have talked about uh, taking action uh, in Congress to try and stop the president and indeed taking potential, trying to encourage perhaps the administration to take action against Turkey in terms of its NATO membership, suspending it from NATO uh, if Turkey conducts this operation. So a lot in flux at the moment. No word, Philippa, from the White House uh, in terms of immediate reaction to the news we're getting this morning. Nothing immediately from the Pentagon either, but I'm sure at points during the day we will hear something from them. Gary, interesting that uh, the eyewitness reports that are coming through seem to show that Kurdish forces uh, are under attack or are being targeted as part of this incursion. And I just want to remind our viewers of a tweet from, from Nikki Haley, a key Republican. On the 7th of October, she said, we must always have the backs of our allies if we expect them to have our back. The Kurds, she says, were instrumental in our successful fight against ISIS in Syria. Leaving them to die is a big mistake. Stake. And that's she's not the only person making that point, of, making that point, as I think you were indicating uh, in the United States. Yeah, I mean, if you remember the the, the whole background to this, Philippa, is, is when the, the Syrian civil war was raging, the U.S. was trying to assemble in southern Turkey a, a kind of force 
of uh, you know free Syrian fighters effectively, and it failed. It tried. It tried it twice. It tried to organise this sort and train this force, and you know it ended up with a couple of dozen fighters, literally. I mean, it was an astonishing military failure in many ways, and that's when um, the U.S. really turned to the Kurds to help uh, the coalition in northern Syria, uh, and that's what she's referring to there in terms of. Uh, you know, the, protecting the Kurds, and of course the Kurds themselves have said that this is a, uh, they regard this as a stab in the back by the United States, uh, given that they, they have been really the sort of centerpiece of the the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, that have been uh, fighting IS in that in that northern part of the country. They're, as we know, they have a, a reputation for being very well trained, uh, they're very well disciplined, uh, but of course for Turkey. Uh, Turkey sees them as a terrorist threat, simple, simple as that, as little different to the, the PKK inside the country. Uh, and for some time the, the Turks have wanted to, to, to get at them, it's clear. What, what was supposed to be happening was a negotiation over a safe zone, a sort of strip of land uh, east of the Euphrates, along the Turkish border, towards the mountains there. And, and that was meant to be, to, in effect, to keep to keep the uh, the sort of the the, the Turkish uh, government happy, and also of course there's some refugee camps in there as well. That safe zone didn't materialise properly; it was not maintained, and that's what now is disappearing as the Americans pull back and and the Turks potentially move in. Gary O'Donoghue in Washington, please do stay with us. I'm just going to remind our viewers of our breaking news, which is that the Turkish incursion over the border into northeast Syria has begun. Turkish warplanes, uh, artillery strikes, howitzer strikes, uh, all taking place, uh, getting reports uh, of those strikes and explosions inside Syria. With me now is uh, Ece Yuxadef uh, from the BBC Turkish service. Can I pick up on what Gary was saying about views of these Kurdish fighters, the YPG, seen as allies of the US, but also treated as terrorists by the Turkish government. Depending on who you're talking to, very different views of who they are. Yeah, actually, uh, we know that the PKK has been fighting against Turkish state for more than 35 years. And we all know that uh, the PKK has the same ideology and following the same leader with the uh, YPG. And YPG has not been established uh, with the starting of Syrian war. They have been there since 2003. And uh, actually, they have been there as under the name of PYD, but uh, YPG is their armed wing. So uh, that's why Turkey has been claiming that they are a terror organization's uh, Syrian offshoot. Uh, that's why they have been telling the U.S. that you already considered the PKK as a terror organization. So there is no difference between the YPG and the PKK. The, the, the only difference is one is operative in Turkey and the other one is operative in Syria. So you cannot help them. You cannot help a terror organization. Uh, that's what Turkey says. Uh, you cannot help a terror organization which attacks your NATO ally. So that this has been the point of discussion since 2014 when the Obama administration first started to support the YPG against uh, ISIS in Syria. And interesting that the, the spokesman for President Erdogan told me a little earlier, you just cannot use a terrorist group, in his words, to fight another terrorist group. And that is the Turkish view. I think, uh, Ece, we can also bring in now our chief international correspondent, Liz Doucette, is on the line. Uh, and Liz, just characterizing the significance of this moment. Very, very significant. You have a NATO member invading a, a sovereign uh, country with the apparent blessing of the United States, even though uh, there have been mixed messages uh, coming out of Washington and even out of President Trump's tweets. But President Erdogan has been signaling for a very long time his dissatisfaction with what he has always regarded as the main threat in Syria to Turkey, and that is, as you've been discussing, uh, the Syrian Kurdish groups, either the military wing of the YPG or the Kurdish-led organization, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which was, we must underline, it was set up by the United States after 2014 explicitly to fight against Islamic State. The United States, uh, the military officers on the ground, the diplomats, did everything they could to ensure that it wasn't 
just a Kurdish organization. There are other, there are Arab fighters in there as, as well. And it has also urged uh, the YPG and the SDF to move away from its allegiances to the PKK. They, that hasn't happened completely, but the United States uh, would want to consider uh, the Syrian Kurdish forces as different from the PKK. Both Turkey and the United States regard the PKK in Turkey um, as a terrorist organization. Lise, thank you very much. I think we can also now go to Orla Girin, who's uh, the BBC's correspondent, who's in Ochakale in Turkey on the border with Syria. Uh, Orla, give us an update, please. Well, within the last half an hour or so, we have been seeing and hearing the opening salvos of this Turkish offensive on northeastern Syria. Uh, if you're hearing noise in the background now, it's police vehicles that are going around announcing to civilians to leave the area. Uh, we have heard uh, outgoing artillery fire and mortar rounds. There has been incoming mortar fire also uh, from just across the border in northeastern Syria, but it didn't reach as far as, as, far as, as Turkish territory. Now, President Erdogan has said this is the beginning of Operation Peace Spring, as he calls it, but I think there's no doubt that for the Syrian civilians who are just across the border within sight of us here, this is going to feel like another round of battle in, in an agonizingly long war. Yeah, President Erdogan is saying, Orla, that uh, the operation is intended to create space for, for maybe two million refugees to be able to return to Syria, a long process. Yes, I mean, the Turks' stated objectives here are twofold. First of all, they say they want to create what they call a safe zone or essentially a buffer, a security buffer along their border. And they say they want to allow for the return of about 2 million Syrian refugees. Now, Turkey has been hosting 3.6 million Syrians. It's a considerable burden on the economy. It's a political issue for, for President Erdogan. And he is anxious to see those refugees go back. But the Syrian Kurdish forces say that actually... What's at stake here is uh, demographic engineering, that the, that the Turks wish to send Syrian Arab refugees uh, across the border into this part of northeastern Syria, which they regard very much as Kurdish territory. So they claim this is really an attempt to dilute their influence and their control. And of course, they also have been emphasizing almost frantically in the last few days that the gains that have been made and were so hard fought and hard won in their long battle against Islamic State, are now being put at risk. I mean, the Syrian Democratic Forces have lost an estimated 11,000 fighters in battling IS. They succeeded, with American help, to push IS out of a large swathe of territory. But they say that those gains are at risk. They point out that, for example, they may have to withdraw some of their forces from the prisons where they are guarding about 10,000 IS fighters. They say they may have to withdraw men from territory that has been recently liberated from IS. And they point out that just last night there was an attack in Raqqa. Now, you'll remember that was the former capital of the IS caliphate. And last night, three IS suicide bombers struck Kurdish positions in the city. So the Kurds are basically saying to the international community, the, for, the war that we fought on your behalf is now being put at risk. All of those gains are now at risk because of what Turkey is trying to do. President Erdogan's spokesman, speaking to me uh, just in the last couple of hours, Orla, said of the Kurdish fighters, they better pull out, they better pull out. Uh, and yet the point has been made by, by politicians in Washington, for example, that the Kurds have been instrumental in defeating the self-styled Islamic State and, as you say, in holding thousands of prisoners. Well, first of all, I, I think it's very unlikely that the Kurds would want to pull out. They have said that they will stand and fight, that, that they will resist they have called for civilians to mobilize over a three-day period and to get to the border and operate as a human shield and indeed to, to help them by taking up arms. So I don't think the Kurds will be of a mood that they should surrender to the Turks. But also the, the issue is this. If they were to pull out, there would be a very dangerous security vacuum. President Trump himself emphasized earlier on during the week that as far as he's concerned, the many IS prisoners are Turkey's problem. Uh, that it's up to Turkey to make sure that they remain secure, that they do not have a chance to regroup, that jailbreaks cannot take place uh, in a moment of chaos during a conflict. And, and certainly the position of the Kurds is that if they have to focus now on defending themselves and their territory, that will have to be their first priority. 
and not the security of the IS prisoners. Uh, Ola Giran, there on the border between uh, Turkey and Syria, we are talking about, and in fact you're witnessing some of the Turkish military incursion. We are hearing about... We're, Ola, if you, I don't know if you can still hear us here on BBC World News. Uh, just if you can, to say uh, we're witnessing the Turkish military incursion. But what's happening as far as other Syrian forces are concerned? I mean, are they involved or do we just not know? Well, so far it's very unclear what's happening across the border. And the only indication we've had of a military response from that side is some incoming mortar fire, which actually fell short of the border position where we are. So those mortars did not land on Turkish territory. But I, I think now that the offensive has begun, certainly the Syrian Kurds will be moving into high gear to try and defend their territory. <coughs> Excuse me. They will be moving into high gear to try and defend their territory. And I think the other immediate consequence will probably be uh, yet another round of displacement for the many Syrian civilians on the other side. Now, the European Union was warning this week before the operation even began that there could be massive displacement. We had warnings also from the UN, from their humanitarian officials, that uh, they were preparing for the worst, essentially. So I think there will be huge concern now about what happens to civilians who will be trapped on the other side of this. And just to pick up on what you're saying there, Orla, we do have reports coming in from Syrian Kurdish media uh, about um, the saying that on the ground the first wave of refugees has begun evacuating the bombed areas in Tal Abiyat, uh, also the predominantly Kurdish town of Raz al Ain. Uh, we've been talking about these two towns in particular. Uh, and that concern that you've identified about more refugees being created is a concern at the UN as well. Uh, we've been hearing that in recent days. Well, certainly Tal Abiyat is just across the border from where I'm standing. And even as I'm speaking to you now, I can see smoke still rising from where a mortar landed. And it appeared, from what we can see with the naked eye, to be just outside a heavily populated area. I can see three, four, five-storey uh, apartment blocks. So certainly this fell as far as we can make out at the edge of a resident. <coughs> excuse me, at the edge of a residential district, and, and perhaps uh, has caused damage to, or, or indeed uh, injury to civilians who are there, but certainly it would cause a great deal of fear and anxiety, and it's, it's not surprising uh, to, to discover that civilians are already on the move. And you may be able to hear in the background here intermittently uh, the noise of a loud hailer, which is actually local police here on the Turkish side who are urging civilians uh, to leave this area near the border. The eyewitness reports there from our correspondent on the border, Ola Giran. Ola, thank you very much for giving us uh, that detailed update on what is happening and what you're seeing and hearing uh, with evidence there of that Turkish incursion uh, into northern Syria. Let's bring in for a bit of more perspective now uh, also our world affairs correspondent, Paul Adams. He's in the BBC's uh, newsroom. Uh, Paul, just to, to, to get a bigger picture here, this incursion, this, this move against Kurdish militia is something that Turkey has desired for some time. Oh yes, this is something that President Erdogan has made it very clear for many, many months that he wants to do. It's a continuation of a long-standing effort on his part to clear the entire Syrian-Turkish border of what he regards as a terrorist threat, the threat posed by the Kurdish-led militias. He did it already a year and a half ago, further west in the area of Afrin. That is an operation that is still going on. Uh, and now he's carrying out a much, uh, he's initiating a much bigger operation, which is hundreds of miles of the border uh, stretching over uh, to the east, to the Iraqi border. Uh, so the scale of this will be much, much bigger than the Afrin operation. And that means that the potential for this to go wrong is also much bigger. By and large, the Afrin operation went according to plan and without creating too much of a humanitarian uh, disaster. The, the, the potential for that uh, to happen this time uh, is quite considerable. And I think a lot depends on the extent of uh, President Erdogan's ambitions. If he just wants to create this buffer zone along the border, some 20 or 30 kilometers or so, then it may be uh, that he can do that uh, relatively straightforwardly. And uh, there's been some evidence in recent weeks that some Kurdish units have pull back from the border area precisely in anticipation of that. But in those towns, 
uh, Ras al Ain and Tel Abyad, uh, where there are significant populations that Orla was just talking about, uh, that's where, you know, that, that, that's going to be the first hurdle. Uh, can this operation uh, secure those towns, which are well inside this buffer zone, uh, before moving on? And to what extent do the Kurds uh, decide to, 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 to stay there and fight? It's worth noting, by the way, that when it comes to the ground operation, this won't just be the Turkish army. They will be sending in their Syrian allies uh, from the Afrin region, uh, units who left that region a couple of days ago and have been transported through southern Turkey uh, precisely for this operation. So what you're going to have are Syrian fighters fighting other Syrian fighters, Arabs against Kurds. Uh, and in some cases, Arabs against Arabs. It's going to be a very complicated mix of units involved uh, in, this, uh, in this operation, uh, which is sort of typical of the way the war in Syria has been all along. And, Paul, just looking at outside reactions to this, um, we've just had, for example, the European Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker, condemning Turkey's military actions, saying he's calling on Turkey to act with restraint and to stop the operations which are under way. This military action, he says, isn't leading to a good result. We have a very a, a complete divergence here, don't we, between uh, the Turks identifying the PKK, YPG, Kurdish fighters as terrorists and others, including Washington, including many in Europe, seeing the Kurds as brave fighters who've been instrumental in the fight against Islamic State. Well, this is complicated because, by and large, the international community, the United States and the Europeans, regard the PKK, the Turkish Kurdish guerrilla movement, as a terrorist organization. Uh, where things get complicated is the relationship between the PKK in Turkey and the YPG, uh, the Kurdish units, in Syria. Now, Turkey says that essentially there's no difference. They're all the same and their objectives are all the same. Clearly, the Europeans and the United States, who have fought alongside the YPG uh, in the battle against so-called Islamic State, have a very different take uh, on the, uh, the YPG. And that's why uh, the, uh, the Turkish uh, ambitions uh, and, and objectives for this operation run uh, counter and, 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 and in the face of uh, what the international community, at least the West, has been trying to achieve in northern Syria, which is the defeat of so-called Islamic State. And, of course, that is a battle which uh, Donald Trump's tweets notwithstanding is not over. Uh, there, are, there are signs that, the, that uh, Islamic State uh, is poised to at least create a, a degree of mayhem, perhaps reconstitute its forces, and perhaps retake territory. Uh, and that is a point that the Kurds are making very vociferously at the moment. Uh, and so we heard in the British Parliament yesterday uh, significant expressions of concern from the British government uh, that the fight against so-called Islamic State would be uh, weakened as a result of this. We heard similar uh, comments coming from anguished members of the Republican Party, Donald Trump's own allies in Congress uh, in, in the last couple of days in Washington. So at, at all sorts of levels and in all sorts of ways, this is an operation which is causing enormous anxiety. And as I said before, much will depend on the way President Erdogan decides to conduct this. Paul Adams, thank you. Well, here on BBC News, we're trying to bring you the big picture and the potential fallout from this Turkish incursion and eyewitness reports from the ground. Let's bring you the latest pictures that have just come into us. Uh, these are pictures. This is exactly what Orla Giren was just talking about. She is witnessing this, uh, the Syrian town of Tel Abiyad. That's just across the border from where our BBC team is stationed. Uh, explosions. You can see the smoke rising. Orla was just telling us she could hear the loudspeakers uh, from police uh, telling people, civilians to get out, people to stay back, as this Tel Abiyat is one of the towns that is being actively targeted right now uh, by the Turkish military. Well, also just to remind you that uh, here on Impact, we've been speaking to President Erdogan's uh, special advisor, Ibrahim Cullen. Uh, I asked him earlier if an all-out assault on Kurdish forces was something he saw as essential and necessary part of this Turkish incursion.
The goal is to clear and secure our borders along uh, Syria uh, to, by eliminating all the terrorist elements uh, from that border. And the second one is to create space for the refugees to return to uh, safely and voluntarily. And uh, uh, the, we do this within the framework of uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 2254, and uh, we fully support and respect Syria's territorial integrity and political unity. Turkey has no intention in occupying any part of Syria. Well, let's go back to our chief international correspondent, Liz Doucette, who's on the line, and the Turkish uh, advisor there to President Erdogan saying, we respect Syrian integrity, we are not going to be an occupying force. This is a, a limited incursion. Well, it's become a maxim in military interventions whenever they happen that it's very easy to go in, very hard to come out. It's not the first time that Turkey has crossed the border and has found itself bogged down in a fight which almost inevitably becomes much harder, has a higher humanitarian cost, has a much bigger backlash than is expected by the military planners. As you've been discussing on this program, Turkey has for a very long time warned that it would take action against what it regards as the main threat in Syria. In fact, ironically, regarding the Syrian Kurds and their links to the PKK as a bigger threat than that of so-called Islamic State. But you also heard from President Erdogan's spokesperson that they wanted to allow uh, Syrian refugees now living in Turkey to return safely and voluntarily. Voluntarily is the most important word. It is a violation of international humanitarian law to force people to return to their countries of origin. But what we have heard in recent months is fearful stories of Syrian uh, refugees, particularly in Istanbul, uh, pushing them out uh, of that city, pushing them toward areas closer to the border, and then some being forced to cross. And I think that would be the fear of Syrians uh, who've been living now for, for several years, in some cases, in, in Turkey, uh, that they will now be forced to return to an area, which, as you heard from Orlegirin recently, is a predominantly Kurdish area, and these are Arab families predominantly, and they may not find a welcome, and they may not be, find either security, a livelihood, safety, uh, a means for them to resume their life, notwithstanding the fact that many Syrians would like to go home once uh, the conditions permit. And I, I suppose one should mention, I mean, the generosity of Turkey in taking in more than three million refugees, certainly more than European countries have taken in. And President Erdogan has been urging, begging, demanding that Europe should do much more to help with the Syrian refugee crisis. And I think he has felt, well, if Turkey's not, if the rest of the world is not going to help me, then I'm going to have to basically deal with this problem myself. Lise, thank you very much. We're going to bring in live pictures as well uh, from the Syria-Turkey border. Kamishli? Uh, uh, with this as President Erdogan has confirmed that the, that the Turkish offensive into northern Syria has started. Lise, I just want to bring up with you uh, another quote that has just um, dropped. Reuters reporting that the Syrian rebel force that's backed by Turkey, it's not just Turks involved in this incursion, is telling its fighters to, to have no mercy on the Kurdish YPG. The quote is, strike them with an iron fist. And I think it probably is worth uh, just reminding our viewers that uh, this is very complicated and that, uh, that Syrians are involved in this Turkish incursion as well. As the Syrian war dragged on, and it's now coming up to its ninth year, Syria, Turkey, as one of the neighbors of Syria, became more and more involved on the military front, uh, especially since a lot of the, the, the Syrian fighters ended up also seeking refuge in Turkey. Turkey began training some of them. So you now have Turkish-backed forces fighting in Idlib, uh, which is the last uh, province in the north uh, e northwest of Syria, which is still in oh, rebel okay. hands. Yeah. You also have a new version of what's called the Free Me, which was the first armed group to emerge from the peaceful protests in Syria in 2011 and 2012. What we've seen in recent years is some of the Free Syrian Army who fled the battlefield as the Syrian Army advanced. They were retrained and regrouped by Turkey under a new Free Syrian Army, and they, we understand, 
are also getting involved at Turkey's urging in this new battle. Just for viewers who are joining us, uh, we are talking about the Turkish military incursion into northern Syria. That is our breaking news at this hour, that this uh, invasion, this incursion uh, has begun. And you're, the pictures you're seeing now, uh, the smoke coming up, explosions have been heard from one of the towns, uh, Tel Abyad, that has been uh, targeted. Uh, so those are uh, pictures coming in now. We have a team live just back uh, from the pictures you're seeing, just back on the other side of the border witnessing uh, what is going on. Uh, Lise Doucette, our chief international correspondent, is on the, the line. Uh, Lise, also just want to say uh, we're getting more international reaction to what is happening, including, for example, Jean-Claude Juncker, key European Union voice, of course, condemning the Turkish military action, saying it won't lead to a good result. Uh, don't ex and he also says, don't expect the European Union to pay for any of your safe zone. Breaking news coming in right now on Turkish forces having started military operations in northern Syria. We are now hearing that U.S.-backed Kurdish forces are saying that Turkish warplanes are carrying out airstrikes on civilian areas there. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Sandra Smith. I'm Bill Hemmer. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. Pentagon officials telling Fox News the U.S. will not be flying air support for the Kurds. This follows President Trump's decision late Sunday to withdraw troops, U.S. troops, from Syria amid accusations that Washington's not moving fast enough to set up the safe zones there. Trey Yinks is live in our Mideast Bureau with the latest on what is happening there this morning. Trey. Sandra, good morning. The Turkish military operation into northern Syria is underway. Here is what we know so far. We're getting reports from the ground indicating that Turkish F-16s are targeting Syrian towns along the border. According to reports, there are ammunition depots being hit, as well as open fields where Kurdish fighters would normally use these locations to launch attacks should this invasion begin. And it does appear, at least from the air, it has started. We did see images this week of Turkish military tanks and also artillery units along the Syrian border. But there's a lot of moving parts here as this news does break. There's also reports of civilians fleeing many of these villages. So there's a humanitarian crisis developing as this larger conflict does erupt. It was announced this morning by Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan on Twitter, who did say the Turkish armed forces, together with the Syrian National Army, just launched what they are calling, quote, Operation Peace Spring. There's two sides to this conflict that are evolving. One side is the Turkish military, along with rebel forces that have previously fought the Assad regime. And then you have, on the other side, these Kurdish forces in northern Syria. The key here to look at and to see what develops over the next 24 hours is whether or not these Kurdish forces do strike some sort of deal with the regime of Bashar al-Assad. This week, uh, we have received indications that Moscow might actually be brokering a deal between the Kurds in northern Syria and the Assad regime to try to push back this Turkish invasion. Uh, when you step back and look at this from a larger perspective, many of the Kurds are saying that they have been abandoned by the Trump administration. Remember, in the fight against the Islamic State, the Kurds lost more than 11,000 fighters. So they see all of this as something uh, that is a direct threat to their people. And the Trump administration, as we know, has pulled out those 50 soldiers who were along the border meant to discourage any sort of Turkish operation into northern Syria. Another concern here is the resurgence of the Islamic State. Currently, Kurdish forces are guarding more than 10,000 ISIS fighters that were captured in the region following uh, the fall of the Islamic State. So there is a concern here because Kurdish commanders have said this is going to be a second priority if this invasion is launched. So guarding these ISIS fighters, there's a lot of moving parts. And the Trump administration has indicated that this fight is over for the Americans when it comes to securing this part of the Middle East. So what we could see here moving forward, a, the resurgence of the Islamic State and other uh, terrorist, terrorist factions in the region. Additionally, high civilian casualties if this does uh, get underway and target civilian areas from the perspective of the Turkish military. And then additionally, you're going to see clashes today if those Turkish ground forces do enter northern Syria. Again, as we know right now, the operation, uh, what the Turks are calling Operation Peace Spring has begun. It is starting with airstrikes along the Turkish-Syrian border. And if reports are correct, uh, a, a number of reports this week indicating that Turkey does plan to then launch a ground operation. You would see artillery units 
Turkish tanks and military personnel entering northern Syria to set up what the Turks are calling the civilian safe zone. But right now, this region is anything but safe for civilians. And remember, the families of many of those Kurdish fighters who fought on behalf of the United States and the, and the West are at risk right now. These are the people who are going to be caught in the crossfire as this operation does continue to develop. Sandra? A developing situation there. Trey Yanks, thank you. Thank you, Trey. Folks, an invasion is underway in northern Syria. Turkey's President Erdogan said the military offensive there has begun. Hundreds of civilians have been fleeing areas on the border within the last 30 minutes. According to the Syrian Democratic Forces, of course, America's close ally in the fight against ISIS, there is, quote, huge panic right now as warplanes have started to carry out airstrikes. Those allies, by the way, say they've been abandoned by the U.S. CNN's Nick Payton Walsh, he is on the phone from right in the middle of it on the Turkish-Syrian border. Tell us what you're seeing and hearing now, Nick. Yeah, Jim, since uh, we last spoke, uh, I can actually deny, correct myself, it seemed that much of the shelling we could see had slowed down. With all the comms and the cell phone towers, it seems to have been switched off in the area around the attack occurred. We've had to move away. I can see what looks like possibly another plume of smoke on the horizon here, but that initial barrage of shelling that we heard that clearly heralded the beginning of this invasion and also was matched by a statement to that effect by Turkish President Erdogan. That may have slowed. It may be also occurring elsewhere. Turkish state television has been playing uh, air aircraft at a nearby base. Uh, it's called Yabakir. Uh, it seems preparing to launch uh, the bombing runs that you referred to uh, earlier on. But as far, well, far as what we've seen so far, it does appear this has been mostly artillery that have begun this operation. And I should say Clearly, the sh shells that we've seen land have been landing in areas that didn't appear to be populated from our vantage point. So, clearly, this is the beginning part of what the operation intends to do, perhaps softening up the ground they intend to move into. Uh, we have seen plumes of smoke in the vast expanses here, plumes of dust, I should say, which could be Turkish military convoys on the move, and we've seen large amounts of Turkish uh, hardware on the highways around this particular area. But it is a vast expanse, Jim, as you know, if this is an enormous operation if Turkey intends to take 18 miles worth of the, uh, the corridor border area, as was suggested by its president at the UN recently. Maybe a smaller objective initially. We know, of course, that U.S. forces pulled back from Tel Aviv, the Syrian town, where we were precisely about an hour ago uh, in Akshaki on the other side of the Turkish border. And there's another town called Ras Al Ain, which they've also pulled back from too. That's possibly where it begins. They are themselves about an hour's drive apart from each other. Vast distances here really to be considered to be covered. Uh, but as you know, Turkey's military is the second largest in NATO. And so very possibly they have the numbers here to do what they wish. The question is how long do they have the appetite for potentially a Syrian Kurdish insurgency or war of attrition against them? As we were with the Syrian Kurds ourselves watching them fight ISIS, they lengthily complained about not having the heavy weapons, the armor they needed to fight ISIS. Well, that leaves them very poorly defended, frankly, uh, in the face of a NATO-equipped army with air power, possibly. I haven't heard jets in the sky, I should say, but air power possibly backing them up too. So while well, the Syrian Kurds, I think, have a morale possibly having long sought a homeland in northeastern Syria, they certainly haven't got the equipment, but we're into a whole new phase now, sadly, in Syria's civil war. Many had perhaps hoped it was beginning to find messy conclusions to its internecine bloodshed, but it seems now that Turkey, who's long sought pushing back the Syrian Kurds that shed so much of the losses, took so much of uh, the brunt of the bloodshed when they fought ISIS back with U.S. power, that Turkey was so keen to push the Syrian Kurds back, frankly, they even seem to be risking now the possibility of U.S. sanctions for this military operation. Yeah. But it's a clear goal for the Turkish president. He's now announced the operation on the way, Jim Poppy. Yeah, listen, uh, Turkey calls those Syrian forces terrorists. Right. Reason to be skeptical of that, of course, is that the U.S. fought alongside them, fighting yep. actual terrorists, ISIS there. Nick, Nick, tell us as you're watching this, and these are live pictures folks at home should know of the offensive, this withdrawal helps Russia as well, does it not? <laughs> Oh, no doubt about that. Absolutely, yes. I mean, the key possible avenue the Syrian Kurds first turned to is the Syrian regime in Damascus. We haven't seen concrete results of that yet, but they're an ally of Russia, of Moscow. And so that will possibly yield this part of territory into a more favorable condition for Russian influence. Certainly. And, of course, any point in the Middle East, as we've seen, uh, when Russia first moved in after Barack Obama decided not to bomb 
when the Syrian regime broke his red line in 2013 and used chemical weapons, Russia stepped into what they perceived as a power vacuum. They'll do so again here, absolutely, no question of that. And the Syrian Kurds themselves find, of course, find themselves in an impossible position. I think they knew this moment was eventually going to come. Donald Trump, uh, Trump tried to pull troops out in December of last year, but was convinced not to by his uh, sort of security elements of his cabinet. Uh, but it appears that he signaled he wants to do that now. I should stress that U.S. troops haven't left northern Syria and in Amman. They just reposition themselves in small numbers so as not to be caught in the crossfire here. But the message has been clear, really, that the Syrian Kurds probably have to find new alliances here, and that will leave them furious at the bloodshed they've suffered, at perhaps the promises they felt they had of support in the future, uh, and now facing the Turkish uh, military's wrath. This is a vastly strategically important part uh, of the Middle East. It spans between Iran, Iraq, uh, and Israel. It's been the corridor through which the Iranians have been accused of shipping materiel to assist their allies uh, north of Israel. Pretty much anything which has been a problem in the past two decades in the Middle East potentially stems back to here, particularly comes to U.S. policy. So we've just really thrown, I think, another hand grenade into an area which is already smoldering and rubble. Jim? Yeah. Uh, well, Nick Payton Walsh, good to have you on the ground. They're covering this as only CNN can. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, we'll stay all over that. And let's talk about the situation in Syria more with Democratic Congressman of California, John Garamendi. He is a senior member on the House Armed Services Committee. Thank you very much for being uh, with me, Congressman. Of course, you were just on sure. the Syrian border this summer. The president wrote this morning that the U.S., quote, should never have been in the Middle East defending his action once again. Republican uh, Congresswoman Liz Cheney writing this morning, quote, impossible to understand why the president is leaving America's allies to be slaughtered and enabling the return of ISIS. Yeah. Is she right? Well, she's absolutely correct. And the president could not be more incorrect. Does he forget about ISIS? Does he forget about the, uh, what ISIS was doing, taking over uh, not only southern, most of Syria, but most of Iraq also? Uh, this man is totally out of touch with reality, and he has unleashed a new, very, very volatile and dangerous situation uh, in the Middle East. When we were there in March looking at what was going on, we knew then, and I was saying to everybody that would listen, we have to have a stabilization plan put in place. We've got to deal with those ISIS fighters that are in the camps. I would expect right now that the uh, Syrian Kurds are moving away from the uh, camps, the guarding of those camps, and moving to defend their people as uh, Turkey uh, invades their part of the world. Uh, it's going to be a very volatile situation going forward. Let's remind people, of course, Turkey views the Kurds and the Kurdish fighters as terrorists. They were until, you know, days ago, U.S. allies that we fought alongside in northern Syria. Senator Lindsey Graham, who, who generally rushes to the president's defense on all things, could not disagree with him more here. He told Axios yesterday that the president is putting national security at risk, risking his presidency with this move. And he suggested that NATO, that Turkey rather, be suspended from NATO if they attack the Kurds and also uh, pushed imposing more sanctions on imposing sanctions, period, on Turkey. Do you support, would you be supportive of both of those measures? Well, certainly we need to move forward on all of those areas. There's no doubt that we have to uh, try to regain the stability that existed before the president simply gave Erdogan a green light to do whatever he wants to do in the area. And I'm not only concerned about the Syrian Kurds, but the Kurds them in the uh, country of Turkey are most likely to come under severe attack as the green light has been given to Erdogan but, to but, deal with the Kurds. But just to be clear, Kurds. you support uh, a suspension of Turkey from NATO and sanctions no. on Turkey? Uh, we already have some sanctions in place because of the uh, A- uh, the S-400 uh, uh, yes. aerial Purchase defense from, system. from Russia, and yes. Exactly. So that's also, we've had uh, numerous problems with Turkey. And keep in mind that Erdogan is clearly destroying the democracy that Turkey once enjoyed before he became the president of Turkey. So there's a whole series of issues here we have to push back. We've got to try to regain the stability in the area. How can we do it? Uh, certainly, we're going to have to realize that we cannot leave this area. If we do so, we're going to wind up with ISIS being wow. reinstated. And we have to deal with Turkey. Uh, right. Pushing them out of NATO, I don't think, is a good idea, but holding them in a, into account, continuing to put the pressure on with a variety okay. of issues, sanctions among them. Okay.
Uh, Congressman, let's move to domestic politics, if we could here. Yeah. Um, so sure. Reading the White House response to Democratic House leadership, they're not playing ball. They're not going to give uh, the committees, the relevant committees, any of the documents or the testimony that they are asking for in this impeachment inquiry. Is it time for Congress to use the tool that it has not used in a century, inherent contempt? Uh, it may come to that, but first I do think that it's time for us to put a vote on the floor, a resolution for the inquiry, structured in such a way that it uh, can move forward with full power of the Congress behind it. I think that's probably going to come in the next week or so. Uh, that will further strengthen well, Congress's that's, hand. That's interesting now, because Nancy Pelosi does, is not, uh, you know, pointing to that at all. She says, if I want to hold a vote, I will. If I don't, I don't. You not only think yeah. Congress should, you think it's coming within a week. What tells you that? Well, the letter from the White House, absolutely. They want to fight. Okay, then let's let us arm ourselves completely and totally with the full power of Congress. The votes, I'm sure, are there for an impeachment inquiry structured in such a way that we have the full opportunity to get all the information, call in the witnesses, get the details, get the email and all the rest. Uh, with regard to inherent uh, contempt, uh, I've been for that all along. I think that uh, when uh, the uh, witnesses come and they sim simply refuse to answer questions. I think it's time to call in the sergeant at arms, march them off to our little jail, which we do happen to have in one of the rooms of the uh, of the Capitol, and let them sit there and cool so, off for a while. So you'd put Ambassador Sondland, Bill Barr, Don McGahn in jail? I would use the full power, and among that is this question of inherent uh, rights of the Congress to hold people. I think we ought to be prepared to go all out on this. We cannot, this is a fundamental question of the Constitution and the separation of powers. And there's a dozen other issues in which this president has assumed uh, powers of Congress, specifically money out of uh, NATO and taking a more than a tr uh, hundred and see, one point six billion dollars out of NATO to build his border wall, completely ignoring the appropriation power of Congress, the power of the purse. But there are numerous things that we need to do to push back. And but you're right talking now, the about, you're talking about dif different issues here. I'm specifically focusing yeah. on the Ukraine call and, and right. the focus of this impeachment inquiry right now. And, and that question of inherent contempt was to that issue. I mean, what um, do you say to critics sure. who would listen to what your argument and say you're throwing the kitchen sink in here, you just don't want the president in office? No, what I want is for the constitutional separation of powers to be abided now and into the future. If we let this go, we're going to have a very different government. Yes, we ought to use the full powers on the Ukraine. And did somebody forget about the Mueller investigation and McGahn and others that have totally stonewalled that issue? Uh, the stonewalling is on every single issue that's out there. But we need to focus on the Ukraine situation, which is enough in okay. and of itself. Congressman John Garmendi, thank you for being here on both of those topics. We appreciate your time this morning. Certainly. Thank you.